give God the glory. Please be seated. The mic working all right? That's the first question. Are we on? Yeah, no. Okay, we're not on. Let's see what the story is. It could be, it says on. It's mic number two. Here we go. Oh. <laughs> it's wonderful to have bishops who are effective in their ministries. <laughs> And you surely have a bishop who's effective in his ministry. Monsieur Bill, it's, it's wonderful to, to, to be here. It's wonderful to be here uh, in New England and with all of you. Um, this is a great opportunity uh, and a great occasion in the life of the whole church. Um, Jesus speaks these words. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Uh, picture these situations, if you will. Young man who himself was once homeless begins a congregation for the homeless and reaches hundreds on the streets. A young couple, with a, both of them with an artistic bent, gathering a congregation that accesses people uh, through uh, their body art, <laughs> through tattoos and the stories behind those tattoos. A bivocational priest who loves the elderly and founds a congregation in an assisted living community, a congregation that in turn decides to plant more congregations in other assisted living communities. Or if you will picture a seminarian uh, raised in a Christian household, but a household with much more law than grace, who determines to and believes he's called to establish a congregation on a Christian college campus, calling the church grace and inviting those who only know law into the experience of God's love. Picture, if you will, a band of displaced believers um, who are used to cathedral music, who determine that the Lord is calling them into the city's restaurant district to establish a congregation they call Incarnation, which helps people to understand that God can be reached through beautiful things and beautiful songs. Imagine, if you will, a Kenyan emigre uh, who's involved uh, in an Anglo congregation who recognizes that there are hundreds of Kenyans in the city and who invites his congregation to found a new congregation that's a Kenyan service in the Anglo church. Or picture a group of retired men um, who have a Matthew 25 heart and carry the Kairos movement to a maximum security prison where there's now a congregation of believers. Imagine a Christian mom trying to help the underserved in her community just because she cares about people and she's a Christian believer 
and she discovers scores of first-generation Hispanics, Latinos. She befriends them. She connects them to the local social services, establishes an English as a second language school, and suddenly there's a Spanish congregation in her church. Imagine all those things, if you will. This is the Anglican Church in North America. The congregations I describe are actually congregations I know in the Diocese of Pittsburgh, but you know lots of these congregations here in New England. There are hundreds of them, hundreds and hundreds of these stories. And I believe there are thousands more yet to happen, right? Thousands more yet to be established. The Anglican Church in North America says that the church's mission is chiefly done through its mission agencies, and those agencies are chiefly local congregations. That's how the transforming love of Jesus Christ reaches the local community. It's how the transforming love of Jesus Christ reaches the nations, quite literally the nations that are all here together in this land. The fundamental agency the local congregation. What Bishop Bill has asked me to do is to address you in some manner about how this all fits together. <laughs> um, uh, what's the coherence? It's a question that I'm often asked as I travel ar around the world and uh, folks examine me about what's happening here and about this thing called the Anglican Church in North America, which is how I always refer to it as opposed to something that sounds a bit like a skin disease. <laughs> uh, I, I'd in, encourage you to, to, to always refer to it as the Anglican Church or the Anglican Church in North America, because that's what we are. Anyway, they want to know what holds it together. Is there any coherence? And so uh, what I'm going to speak to today is how all those examples of congregations and how all the congregations that you represent hold together. What's our coherence? How would you make sense of us? The first answer to the question is, of course, that it all holds together in Jesus Christ, right? And that's what this enterprise is all about. That's who we proclaim. That's whose love we try to bear. Um, that's whose message we bring to the world. Jesus, he himself says that he's the life as we look around, it's no wonder that, um, that Hollywood does a lot with zombies and the living dead. Don't you see a lot of living dead all around you? You know, or living sort of who need some kind of, um, some kind of uh, medicine to dull the pain or to mask the symptoms of a life that's a life without meaning. Jesus says that he comes to give life and to give it abundantly. Um, we know a Lord, we have a master who um, is, is what it is to be alive. And, and we in this room know that. Remember that Jesus speaks these words in John 10, 
in the context of his teaching about sheep and their shepherd. And he says it's the thief who comes to kill and destroy. That's the first half of the 10th verse of the 10th chapter of John's Gospel, and the second half of the 10th verse of the 10th chapter of John's Gospel. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it abundantly. Jesus is the coherence. He's, he's the chief answer to the question, how does it all hang together? He's the life. He also says, as you well know, in John's Gospel, that he's also the way, the path where we're on a journey somewhere. This life does have meaning when it's a life lived for God and for Him and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And there is a way. And He is that way. There's also truth. It's a very inconvenient idea in post-modernity that there's actually the truth, <laughs> right? And Jesus is the truth, and that truth is also our coherence. It's how this whole movement hangs together. Jesus bridges all time. Jesus bridges all peoples, all nations. He bridges all divisions. And it is he whom we know and proclaim. In each of the situations that I described as congregations of the Anglican Church in North America, congregations that all of you represent, in each of those situations, it's Jesus who bridges the separations, who covers the alienation, and who brings people together in himself and with himself. It's also the case brothers and sisters, that this all fits together, not only in Jesus, um, but in his body called the church. Okay. Again, he, he ascended bodily into heaven, and he gave the Holy Spirit to his followers that they might be what? The body of Christ. And you are the body of Christ. Remember what Peter says in his first letter to the church? You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, that you may declare the wonderful deeds of him who has called you out of darkness and his marvelous light. That's our identity, church. It's our identity in Him, but it's also our identity when we are who He's called us to be. And one of the ways in which we could describe um, what His body looks like, and it, it's, it's pretty useful to actually go to the foundational documents, <laughs> Uh, there are four things in the creed that are called the marks of the church, right? Okay, what is it? It's one. Okay. So, all these local congregations that I speak of and you represent, they all are one in the church. There's no such thing as an individual Christian in one sense. And there's no such thing as an individual church, because the church must be one. And its oneness is amazing. 
uh, because it's not only transcultural and transnational, but it's transtemporal. Okay, so we're, you know, today's St. Matthew's Day. Okay, so Matthew or a pronobis? <laughs> Matthew, the whole company. We'll pray later in the day together with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. Do you believe that? <laughs> are they singing that song? Are we singing that song? The church is one throughout the world and throughout all time. And the church is one in bridging heaven and earth. The creed also says that the church is holy. And we really, brothers and sisters, that these are the things we aspire to. The church is holy. It's set apart. It's different. Again, when they walk in our doors, they're supposed to have a foretaste of heaven. You know? These old places are built like ships. And that's the navis, the ship. <laughs> you know, and it's moving toward the heavenly choirs and the heavenly reality and the feast that never ends. It's not like the world outside. It doesn't, it doesn't reflect that world. It reflects another world. It's holy. It's set apart. And that's what that's a part of what unites us and gives us coherence. Many of us came out of situations where the church was unfaithful, where instead of the truth without diminishment, there was constant compromise and unholiness. We're called to be his body, and that is, as the Anglican Church in North America, that's what gives us coherence, that we're living on his rules, not our own desires, right? I mean, we mess up all the time, which is why we begin every day in the daily office with getting on our knees and saying, you know, uh, apart from you, there is no health in us. That actually was a, it is a nice little turn of phrase that the liturgy group did in terms of solving the pro problem that the, uh, the 79 prayer book tried to deal with in terms of their, well, it's not quite true that there's no health in us, right? Well, there is, there is some health in us, but it's actually the Lord's grace. That's the only health there is, right? And if you think it's coming from something else, you got, you got the wrong picture of holiness. The church is one. The church is holy. The church is Catholic. And this is particularly important for us to see. The church, in every local manifestation, conveys the whole truth. It doesn't matter whether it's the church in an assisted living community or the church in a maximum security prison, or the church among tattoo artists on the south side, or it doesn't matter. The church is Catholic. St. Vincent of Lorenz says, it's what's been believed always and everywhere and by all. We often say in the world in which we live that we don't have a, a faith that's our own. Ours is not the only way to be Christian, but it's a reliable way because it's connected to Christians everywhere and what they have always proclaimed and always known and always been everywhere. And always. 
And finally, the creed proclaims that the church is apostolic. <laughs> you know, for better or worse, it has bishops, <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> it, it, and it has the apostles' teaching. I mean, it has both realities. I, I, again, one of the things about Anglicanism is that Anglicans recognize that bishops are useful. <laughs> now, we're particularly useful for encouragement and correction. You don't like the correction so much, but that's how the church remains holy and Catholic and one. You greet me so warmly as Archbishop because I connect you to every other diocese and every other congregation and indeed to the church throughout the world in my office as your primate. The one who represents the whole and what the whole church is about and who keeps the teaching authentic, rooted, clear. So we hang together because we exhibit and we desire the marks of the church, that we are one, that we are holy, that we are Catholic, and that we are apostolic. In all of this, the apostles were, of course, missionaries and evangelists, and some inhabit the office, but all have the work. We are to share with the world. We are witnesses to what Jesus has done. And in our time and in our communities, it's our work to share that truth, that master, that vision. We're a missional church. That is, we're sent just as the apostles were sent. Go and tell what you've seen. We're a global church. Remember, friends, that we came into existence because the church throughout the world gathering in Jerusalem in 2008 with a bit of a proclamation that while Canterbury was important, Jerusalem was even more crucial to the story and to the identity and to who and what we are. But it was a conference there, the Global Anglican Future Conference in Jerusalem that called on us in North America to form the Anglican Church in North America. We would have been and we were hesitant to act without the world church saying to us, it's time to act. And with them making that call, we were ready to respond. And within a year's time, in June 2009, our church, the Anglican Church in North America, was gathered and founded, and we began this life as an Anglican body connected to Anglicans all over the world. Another way in which this, so I've, I've spoken about the marks of the church, spoken at some sort of macro level about the mission and the global identity of the church. 
Uh, in terms of the age we live in, um, a part of what makes sense of us is that we're part of a great Reformation movement. And this is a Reformation time. And in case you hadn't noticed, Reformations are not easy times. Right? They're times of great sacrifice and times of great turmoil. But what's happening in the whole, particularly Christian church in the West, is that we're again being called to embrace what it is that the Scriptures proclaim about who Jesus is and how the law and the prophets point to him. And that the church is not a body that is continually drawn into new truth. I, I, I know we haven't fixed it yet, liturgy committee, but you know, he will lead you into all truth. That's a particular, I mean, yes, John says it, but it suggests in the Pentecost proper preface that he's taken us somewhere new, and he's not. He's taken us somewhere that always was and forever will be. And the now is always trying to connect the ancient future, right? This is a great Reformation time, and we're part of that. And that's a huge part of our story, the Anglican Church in North America. Um, for many of us, we're part of a remnant of a most unfaithful church, right? Uh, it, it's wonderful that increasingly we're, we're, our, 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 our members and our congregations have no recollection of what once was. <laughs> right? I mean, that's pretty good news. <laughs> and, and, and they're not so wounded by the things that happened in the church. They're just wounded by things that have happened in the world. But for us, the church looked like the world, and so there was a lot of wounding, right? <laughs> um, what's a, a part of the truth we have to proclaim and must never forget is that God chooses what is lowly in this world, what is rejected in this world, to do his great work. Now, if I were the Lord, and I am clear that I am not, I wouldn't have chosen a bunch of Episcopalians to lead this Reformation. <laughs> it just makes no sense, right? <laughs> It's just, I mean, I, I mean, I wouldn't have chosen me. I wouldn't have, you know, I don't know all of you well enough, but, you know, I, I suspect your own self-evaluation or the evaluation of those closest to you is that they, that, that it's, a, it's a mystery why God would have chosen, you know, Sally or Joe or, right, or Bob or Bill or, yeah, going down the line. Um, but he did because it's what he does. He chooses, you know, the eighth son, David, or the old woman, Elizabeth. He, he chooses the most unlikely kind of washed up characters, unimportant, otherwise um, without much value, uh, he chooses the likes of us for his work. So never forget those of you who were part of the movement that became the Anglican Church in North America, that God's choice of us is, only, is, the, only, is the kind of choice God makes. <laughs> and you just don't think it was that you were great. <laughs> you know. Well, here are the seven sons, and they're all wonderful, but isn't there one more? Well, he's out tending the sheep. I mean, it's just a boy. 
right? Or an old woman who can't have children who bears the forerunner of the Messiah. I mean, the, the picture, that's our story. That's one of the things that also gives us coherence. It's one of the ways it hangs together. Now, this Anglican church in North America getting more and more specific about what holds us together and who we are and what you're a part of. It, as I said earlier, it's not the only way to be a Christian, but it's a reliable way to be a Christian. That is, to be an Anglican. It's a kind of Christian. One of the realities and one of the things that I think makes it and makes our movement so useful to the world church now and to the broken society, communities, nations in which we live is that our identity has always tried to bridge the evangelical and the Catholic and the charismatic. We don't, we're under the Word of God, right? That's, we can teach nothing that's contrary to God's Word. It's the ultimate rule and standard of faith. We know that, right? But we also know and celebrate that God hasn't been on holiday, as the Brits would say, since apostolic times. I mean, he's actually led his church. He's been connected to his church. And all those who believed from the time of the apostles to the present actually have some things to say to us. They wrestled with the same issues we wrestle with, at least in terms of what it means to be human. And so giving them heed is part of what we do. Now, some of the things we do are things that are not important, except they're important to the family, because the family remembers. You know, when husbands and wives got married, you know, one of you might have come from a family that put an angel on top of the tree, and the other had, came, you know, had a star on top of the tree. And you had to figure out which, you know, they were both important to you. Nara and I have this problem about, I like colored lights, she likes white lights, you know. <laughs> but that's because how it was in her family. You know, some of the things we do, like how we dress for worship, or, you know, that we mix water with the wine. The family's always done it. We remember what the family's always done. We attach significance to it and even theological meaning. But what's happened in 2,000 years, like what is revealed in the Word of God, matters to us. And it's also true for us as Anglicans that we understand that it's not by wisdom, it's not, that, it's not wisdom we come to bring, but the church is grown by the power of God who still shows up. You know, there's nothing like a contemporary miracle to compete with any technology. Have you found that? We'll see. I mean, again, Anglicans know that God still does this stuff, just like it says in the pages of Scripture. So our, our tradition, who we are, what holds us together, is that somehow we hold these three streams together. And in each of our local congregation, one stream may be more significant, more dominant than the other two, 
But what we've been able to say as a church, what I've been able to say as your archbishop, is that any congregation that holds itself accountable to the Word, accountable to the tradition, and accountable to the Holy Spirit, or said another way, to the transformation of society, which is what the Holy Spirit is up to, any congregation that holds itself accountable to those three things in some balance is an Anglican congregation. And of course, the, the truth is, it, it's so much why right now we're so attractive for those who are looking for a solution to both the church's and the world's problems. And it's not that we're anything of ourselves, it's just that we open ourselves at our best to the whole truth about God and about what His church, both in Scripture and through the ages, has looked like. We are in the, the, the great vision that Robert Weber of Wheaton College had. We, we are this ancient future movement. And the, the, those who are looking for something that holds, that lasts, that's a reliable container, or a reliable, yeah, it's container's a good word, reliable container for the Christian truth it, it is, it can be found here when it's true to itself. We're evangelical and Catholic and charismatic. It's also the case that we have some practical tools that hold us together. Um, we have, uh, I, I remember the story of a uh, uh, congregation that was leaving its building. You know, lots of us have left buildings and stuff behind. Uh, and that was told it could take the Bibles but not the prayer books. <laughs> okay. Um, I, you know, go figure. <laughs> Liturgical Unitarianism. Um, <laughs> I have to be careful in New England. Um, the, the, it was King's Chapel in Boston where Unitarianism began by just striking the Trinitarian formula out of the prayer book. Um, our first tool is the Word of God. We know that. We love that. Our daily office has it re read and engage it every day, every part of it. That's our greatest tool, our greatest truth. We also do understand that the Book of Common Prayer, um, as uh, has been observed, uh, is the Bible arranged for worship. <laughs> and what we're trying to do as we produce a, an authentic prayer book for the 21st century church in North America, for the Anglican church in North America, is to actually restore to the prayer book that deeper sense that it is Scripture arranged for worship. I mean, think back to morning prayer. It's just Scripture arranged for worship. It's, a, it's, it's just such a powerful tool. And again, it is a tool that binds us together, and we must never leave it in the dust. Right now, the Anglican Church in North America is very um, intent on producing a catechism that can be used by the whole church. The catechism, uh, and God willing, 
it'll be available to the church at least as a working document after the College of Bishops meets in January. Um, uh, again, it won't be perfected, but the bishop's standard in this is that it won't do any damage. Okay. <laughs> You'll help us to say the things better than we might have, than we, there, there may be a better way to answer this question. Than that. Right now, my last word from the Catechism Task Force was it's 234 questions and answers. Why so many? Well, because it's a catechism written for a time after Christendom. The old catechisms were written for Christian culture. And that's not where we're living anymore. It will be a document that unites us as a church in teaching that's true and reliable and represents what the church has always said about the Lord Jesus and about all the aspects of human life in relationship to the Lord and in relationship to one another. Um, what we know, and I shared this with a clergy meeting yesterday, was that uh, our catechism uh, it has already been translated into Chinese and Spanish and most wonderfully into Urdu and Farsi. The last two because the Bishop of Iran thinks it's so useful to a non-Christian culture that he can't wait to start to use it with his people. Okay? We know that there is a teaching that the church must receive and we know that we've done a very poor job in discipling the people of the church. Catechism, a practical tool. We also, we, we, we built the, this church on um, a notion uh, and on an understanding that the tithe, ah yes, I said it, the tithe is the minimum standard, yes, minimum standard of Christian giving. Okay? Um, what the church has learned and what we proclaim is that once you're given away at least 10% of what you have, you have to trust the Lord. Right? So, if you aren't doing it, start doing it, <laughs> right? Tithing. Um, again, a tool. We understand that the, the individual gives 10% of what he or she has to the work of God, chiefly through their local parish. And that parish gives 10% to the life of the diocese, and the diocese gives 10% of what it has to the, uh, to the work of the province. You're also part of a province, and some of the, as this weekend flows, um, some of the attention shifts to the Anglican Relief and Development Fund. And that fund, which is the international arm of the Anglican Church in North America in terms of the least and the lost and the last, the standard we've set for ourselves there is that we'll attempt every year to raise as much money for development and relief in the rest of the world as we spend on ourselves in the province here. Okay? So if our budget of the Anglican Church in North America this year is something like $1.7 million, then we're aiming to raise $1.7 million to give to relief and development projects. Because if you have two coats and you see that your neighbor has not one or has none, what do you do? Give him one of your coats. You know, that's kind of 50-50 stewardship. We believe in that too. Tools to keep us honest in who we are. And the practical tool that's the communities of which 
we're apart. We like to say in the Anglican Church in North America that our method is converted individuals in multiplying congregations fueled by the Holy Spirit. Okay, can you say that? Converted individuals in multiplying congregations fueled by the Holy Spirit. Being fueled by the Holy Spirit doesn't relieve you of the tie that just enables the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do through the resources that we have, which he's able to do far more than we enable. But that's our method. I'm coming to the end of what I want to say and the end of the time that Bishop Bill has given me. <laughs> he doesn't have his hook. <laughs> But knowing him as he, he might, you know, just come run and, you know, take me out like, you know, on the line. Um, where we are as a church, part of what is the reality of who we are and the identity of who we are and, and how it all fits together is the kind of mess we're in, okay? We're a church that, that began with a whole group of lifeboats. There was the Rwandan lifeboat, which was the first one. And then there was the Nigerian lifeboat and the Ugandan lifeboat and the Kenyan lifeboat and the South American lifeboat. And there was a lifeboat that was kind of, had been floating there alone for a long time, which was the Reformed Episcopal Church. And a number of other groups who banded together to, to be rescued from what seemed to be a, a ship that was going down and from uh, an unfaithful witness in this part of the world. And there's a vast freedom among us, and we're experimenting with something called affinities, maybe not because we chose it, but because that's the circumstance out of which we come. But the vision is clear. God gave the vision as this movement started to come together after 2003. We're to be a biblical, missionary, and united Anglicanism in North America. That's the vision God's given. And that's the reality toward which we work because we believe it's what God sees for us. Biblical, we're trying to be a New Testament church. Missionary, we have a message to share. And united because the church must be one. And whenever it's divided, it's scandal. Just a footnote in this. The church must be one locally as well as regionally and nationally and globally. And if any Anglican congregation keeps itself cut off from the other Christian congregations in its local community, it's not true to what it's supposed to be. For it's not principally about Anglicanism. Anglicanism is a reliable way of being a Christian. It's not the only way. The issue is following Christ, right? Our mission. Um, it is about abundant life and abundant love. We understand that our task is to reach North America with a transforming love of Jesus Christ. Our task is to reach North America with the transforming love of Jesus Christ. That's how we all fit together. It's exciting as it can be. Part of what you're here to do today is to ask what your place in it is, because none of you are excused from this enterprise? Jesus says, 
I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. And it's into that life and that work that He's called us who understand our work to chiefly be done through the agencies of mission, which are our local parishes. We are to act locally, but think globally. That's how it all fits together. I thank you for your attention. Thank you for your ministry. Um, and together, we'll move forward. God bless you all.